Hi, hello, hello everyone, and uh, a very good evening here from Singapore. Um, and you know, we share the same time zone with Malaysia. Alina and I, we are in the same um, time zone. Um, and of course, you know, friends from Myanmar and Australia. So before that, uh, you know, um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much um, to Arts Equator for organizing this uh, very important conversation. And just to introduce myself, my name is uh, Amin Farid. I'm a practitioner a researcher of the Malay arts here in Singapore and the region. Um, and also the uh, Joint Artistic Director of Bumi Collective. And with me today, allow me to introduce um, our three panellists um, who um, you know, are very eager to share about their perspective on this topic. Um, firstly, we have um, Mr. Twee. Uh, he's a pop puppeteer from Myanmar and is the founder of Twee U Myanmar Traditional Puppet Theatre. And uh, he is doing puppetry both for tourism entertainment and education for the younger practitioners. Um, next, we have Alina Murang. Uh, she is a Sape musician from Sarawak, Malaysia. And the Sape um, is a lute instrument of the Orang Ulu people of Borneo. She works on music and video production with careful thought in honouring cultural heritage in the context of contemporary times. And last but certainly not the least, we have Jacob Bohm. Um, he's a Melbourne born and raised artist of the Naranga and Karuna Nations, South Australia. He is a multidisciplinary theatre maker and choreographer, creating work for stage, screen, public events and festivals. So, so yes, we are all gathered here today to have this conversation um, as what um, Nabila have said about the traditional art, the forgotten COVID casualty. I think, um, you know, just a preamble, uh, we are talking specifically about the, you know, COVID circumstance um, and how this is affecting traditional artists. We have seen a lot of support or non-support coming from um, different sectors. Um, and this is something worthy uh, for us to have a conversation today. So for me to kickstart uh, this conversation, I would like to ask this very simple question to three of my um, fellow colleagues here. Um, and you know, it's, it's a question that is specifically about the current times. Uh, how has COVID-19 specifically affected our practice? and livelihoods as artists and how has it affected traditional arts communities in general um, so maybe to to start this um, conversation going and we also encourage uh, interdisciplinary uh, you know uh, uh, cross national perspectives as well probably i would like to invite jacob first to have that uh, to, to start off this conversation um, so how has the covid 19 affected traditional artists or yourself as an artist um, yes, good evening. Thank you everyone for having me here. Um, so I do, I come from the Narungo Ghana Nations. I work both in contemporary and traditional arts. Um, for us here in Australia, Aboriginal communities, particularly regional and remote area communities that are practicing traditional arts and craft, um, really a lot of a lot of what has happened to Aboriginal communities since COVID has kicked in is practice has, has ceased um, because the government has forcibly locked down um, remote area Aboriginal communities, um, originally against their will. Um, but so I'm doing a project with my own family who are in a remote area in South Australia. So I've been calling my uncles and my aunts for the last ooh, almost four months, five months, um, when COVID first happened, um, they'd locked down, the government had locked down the community, but nobody had planned or thought through how they were going to get essential services like food into those communities. So um, practice or creative practice, even practicing traditional arts and culture was has been the last thing on people's minds, things like caring for elders, um, not starving, they've been the most pressing issues. Mm. All right, thank mm. you so much for that, Jacob. Um, and mm. probably, you know, Alina, um, you know, your, your perspective on this um, current times as well. Um, so for me, how the lockdown 
affected um, my practice was primarily through um, a lot of shows being cancelled. Um, but I mean, that goes for any musician really around the world. And I think it's really affected uh, traditional practitioners in the rural areas. Um, I'm based in Kuala Lumpur, so for me, connection wasn't too bad. Well, connection was, was good, actually. But then there's a lot of um, artists that live in the rural areas, some very rural, some not even that rural, who, number one, didn't have a great um, access to the internet and number two if they did sometimes they don't know how to use it um, to you know in, in this time to do online shows and stuff like that and as well for me um, I don't know when I can next go back to the kampong or to the village to do my documentation to do my research with the elders and you know even just in the short time of lockdown I think like two months we've had like three elders leave us already so for me, the documentation part is very urgent, and I, I don't know when I can go back because you know even if if I if I'm allowed to travel, I'm not sure if I should in case um, you know I'm carrying, I'm a carrier. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Alina, um, and uh, Mr. Tui, do you uh, your perspectives, please? Mingalaba, Mingalaba. I am Mr. Tui. <laughs> or driver to it. Not, not director, not founder of the puppet theater. Because now I'm doing delivery job. Uh -huh. Today, I came back early for this meeting. So uh, we are relying 100% for tourism. So before COVID-19, uh, my living room, my house is full of visitors. So our incomes cover, uh, I spend all my elder, also my Kitchen, but when the COVID starts, the tourism to, totally stop, or let's say zero. So there was no visitor. So I have to change my uh, daily any to get. So uh, because of my Facebook friends, they are doing online shopping, and then they get me job. Then uh, we deliver things around the city. So this is what in Myanmar and what Papetia now doing in Myanmar. Mm. I think what we can hear um, from from you know just this brief exchange so far is you know the idea of you know uh, traditional arts communities in rural communities that have yet to receive uh, attention or at least um, proper uh, support. So um, maybe I would like to also ask um, if you know, if any of you can share whether there are any um, top-down assistance or programs that are coming from the government or you know uh, coming from agencies um, to help these communities, if anybody would like to respond. Yeah, so there's been one initiative here in Australia, um, the Australia Council for the Arts, which is our major federal arts funding body. Um, had done an emergency reshuffle of public monies, of funding grants, to get emergency grants out to a whole bunch of artists. Initially, it was going to contemporary arts only, um, but recently the Australia Council had just given, uh, created a fund called Cherish. Now, under Cherish, one of those um, one of those branches, one of the things that you could apply for was something called the Living Library. So, Alina, this would have applied to you completely, like really about your practice, because under Living Libraries, it was all about giving people funding to go and document elders' knowledge. Because one, one thing that we've all recognised with this virus is that it has attacked our elders. So at least the Australia Council had a small grant, a small funding opportunity <clears throat> that realized the importance of elders' knowledge. So you could apply for funding to go and archive and document. Mm. Oh, so this is the Cherish Fund. That's um, beautiful. I wish we had that here. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah. And, and Alina, probably you can share a little bit about um, you know, whether there are such programs. Um, there are pro programs to support the arts here, um, largely from Chandana. Um, 
not specifically for traditional arts. It would be for music or for uh, visual arts, for example. And there's also a new program from the Ministry of Communications and Culture. If I'm not mistaken, it's more focused on digital support. Um, yeah, so nothing really specifically for traditional arts. Um, there are opportunities. Um, yeah. No, I think I think that's quite true too. In because sometimes when we think of the arts as a monolith, we we assume that all you know the money that goes to the arts is for the arts. But at times we also forget that certain arts would you know require different needs and different um, you know activities to help them um, survive. Uh, and you know, so this is this this is definitely a problem, and and that's why we're talking about it as a forgotten casualty, um, because you know it's it's not something that is um, specifically you know given, um, and a lot like what like what Jacob's saying. Sometimes it's focused mostly for contemporary arts, and not and forgetting that some of these art forms are livelihoods, right? Are are, mm. are not you know arts in itself. It's also very much culture. Um, and you know, like what Jacob was also saying about elders um, as living heritage, you know, mm -hmm. to record. I think I want to ask Mr. Tui. Like, I I, I look at you as an elder uh, of of your form. Are, are there uh, you know agencies okay. that have support to support to support you and and your um, as your knowledge as elder? Uh, in Myanmar, uh, they are. Uh, association called Myanmar Theatric Association. Uh, they support a little bit, but uh, not by government. And also they are support by uh, to the SME, by the Ministry of Tourism. But uh, we are not, uh, we are not like, uh, not register uh, SME, or we are not paying tests to the government. So we are not entitled to get the loan for, for SME, so something mm. like that. And um, Mr. Tui, uh, I like what I understand, you are very dependent on tourism, right? The tourism sector. And now because there, are, there, there hasn't been a lot of tourists coming in, you've also shared that uh, you had to change your career somewhat, right, into a delivery man. Um, uh, are there, has, there, has there been any, you know, um, talks or, uh, in helping, you know, from the tourism sector to to assist in any way. Uh, I think for tourism, is uh, stay there are restriction to travel even in Myanmar. So I but uh, I have an audience who are working in Myanmar, like an embassy or organization. So they like to visit to my theater. But uh, there is a restriction by the government stay end of this month. So I cannot start again. But maybe in next month, uh, we can start our performance again. Mm. So Mr. Tui has shared a little bit about theatrical collectives, uh, you know, to assist that means, you know, more bottom up approach, bot sorry, bottom up approach. So, you know, um, Alina and Jacob, do you have any um, such bottom up approaches um, coming from artist communities or from ordinary citizens? Actually, I just wanted to ask Mr. Tui a question. Sure. Mr. Tui, um, yes. have you, during lockdown, have you done any maybe videos of your puppet theater or any um, videoing of the live show? Does anybody come and help you to do that so people around the world can see your puppet theater? Uh, actually, not because uh, according to my experience, streaming live in Myanmar tradition puppet is not popular and also no audience. That is why I did not try to broadcast live or report on YouTube as well. Because you need the audience. Yes. Oh, that's very interesting. Because uh, in Ma, the traditional arts are very declining after the 1988 uh, political revolution. So we are, the puppet shows or traditional performance are only a question for tourists or foreigners. 
that is a bigger challenge uh, to meet my people. That is why sometimes uh, before COVID, I'm trying to go to school and rural area uh, to make puppetry education to the younger generation. But now we are restricted for traveling, so I can do as well. Uh, I was just also like to one. I, I wonder, uh, Mr. Tweed, do you also have a younger apprentices uh, who you you know specifically mentor for your traditional um, art? Yes, I am very lucky man. <laughs> Because, uh, when I started my theater in 2006, last uh, 14 years, my youngest son was only two years old, and my elder daughter was nine years old. They didn't know about traditional puppetry. They only just playing with puppets. But luckily, after they growing up, they are willingly to learn. And now my son is 16 and my daughter is 23. They are puppeteer of my group. So also they are friends. They came to my house and they learned together. So I am sharing our traditional puppetry to younger generation. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Tui. Alina, probably, you know, the question that you were directing, uh, you have directed to Mr. Tui, <clears throat> is this something that uh, you're also doing on your own as, uh, as an artist? Yeah, so when um, lockdown happened here, I was very quick to get on my Instagram live to do, um, we call, I call them sound baths because it used to be used for healing and for like meditation. But it was the first time I've ever gone on Instagram live and I found it very, very, very strange. Um, but the reception was very good. So I kept, I did it quite often. And then Facebook lives, um, but just, just straight from my phone. Mm, and, and why was it strange? <laughs> Was it because you don't know? In so many ways. You're like sitting in your living room, playing and singing to your phone. You know, this tiny thing in front of you that's like propped up against a glass like that. You know, and you're sitting at it, interacting with the phone. <laughs> it's very strange. And because I don't know if you've heard Sape music, it's like very slow and very calming. And you kind of like finish the song and you're just in your living room and uh, you know people are chatting back at you it's just it's very strange <laughs> um, but yeah i think it we will probably be doing this for a while more i got used to it <laughs> and and do you have artist communities that are helping one another supporting one another in this period so in, in Kuala Lumpur in particular, um, I was very proud and impressed of all the like musicians and produce, music producers because they were very quick to respond to lockdown, doing um, collaborations, um, online shows. Um, so yeah, this, it, it was very, very nice to see people coming together. Even people that would usually be competitive um, would be working together. So that was really nice. Wonderful, a sense of community there. Uh, and Jacob, do you like to share anything? Yeah, one of the wonderful things that have come out of this is um, a new grassroots collective called the Regional Dance Alliance, which is a collective of independent artists, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists that are working in regional and remote um, areas around Australia. Um, we work with and for traditional custodians, with elders, with communities um, in the preservation and maintenance of culture and cultural arts, as well as intergenerational practice, as well as contemporary First Nations um, creative expression. So a lot of us are working in silos. A lot of us work alone um, in those communities. And one of the wonderful things that has happened out of this is that a lot of us have come together. Um, to rely on each other for support, which has then turned into a new grassroots collective called the Regional Dance Alliance, which is also filling a gap um, 
in terms of advocacy, because what we have found is a lot of the voices of traditional communities have been left out of arts advocacy. Therefore, that's why you see a gap in the funding pools or the support. So the Regional Dance Alliance has not only become a support network for other artists, but it's also become an essential voice in advocacy for traditional arts. Mm. Mm. And I'm just wondering, you know, because Australia has a, has a good frame um, somewhat good framework for the arts. Um, I'm mm. just wondering, like for friends in, um, you know, Myanmar, <laughs> Myanmar and Malaysia, like, you know, because sometimes we are hearing that the arts is sometimes, you know, put under tourism and, mm. and, and, and that might not, um, you know, fully reflect or fully um, support the arts in what we, uh, how we would like it to be. So do you have any comments on that? Any, any, any of our friends here? In, in terms of um, traditional arts and culture coming under a banner of tourism here in Australia, um, I think that's where a lot of our, our remote areas um, definitely make, make money. And it's, it's definitely through small business practice and social, entre and, uh, social enterprise. Um, it's more of a business model rather than um, one of the publicly funded arts models that most of us have become used to since the creation of, you know, the Australian Council for the Arts really has only been around since 19, the 1970s. Um, and in that time, we've all, I mean, I've been fortunate to have been brought up in an era where it's just normal for me to think that the government support arts activity. That's what I've grown up with. Um, but what we've seen recently with a, um, a Liberal government, and I mean capital L, not small l, a Conservative government, is that uh, the funding for arts in this country is becoming less and less and less, even more so traditional arts, because the, the, the essentially white government here have no respect, unless it's for tourism purposes. Then we can show that we have Aborigines to the rest of the world and then put them away. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and mm. uh, Alina, do you have anything to comment on that? Or? Um, so, Surat Tourism Board supports me quite a bit when it's in line with, obviously, um, their aim. So I'm very thankful for that. However, as a musician, I would just love to, you know, be embraced as a musician under the music community rather than under tourism um, solely, because I think under tourism, you're kind of especially coming from Borneo, it's like really romanticized and, you know, sometimes I just want to play a bit of rock music or something. And um, yeah, I think here uh, Arts and Culture sits under the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, um, whereas uh, music has kind of been taken over by the Ministry of Communications. Um, so it's all kind of like patchy here and there. Um, Chundana was formed about maybe two, three years ago now. Um, so that's really helped kind of bring things together, but I think there's still a lot that needs to be done. Um, but yeah, so I've been slowly trying to find my way into that music kind of uh, department or arena and sit like in mainstream music um, as well. So then I can sit in both tourism and music, I guess. Mm, okay. Uh, Mr. Twee, do you have anything to comment on that? Yes. Uh... For the government, uh, I would like to explain a little bit now because okay. Myanmar is not like other countries in the region. We have now, let's say, a democratic government. But uh, we are the British colony about 100 years and we got independent in 1948. From 1948 to 1962, uh, said this is a parliament democracy government at the time. But uh, in 1962, a military seized the power and they changed socialist system. So we are under the socialist government 26 years from 1962 to 1988. And 1988, there was a political change, crisis. And 1992, we had the first election, but uh, the party who won in the election was not handed over. And then military governments, they took the power and they made the constitution for 
17 years, 17. And in 2010, they made second election. But the government won in the election, they are from, let's say, socialist government or military government. And then 2010 to 2015, we are first democratic government again. But uh, they are from military. Most of them are generals. So in Myanmar, puppetry uh, is paid and approved of by the government. Why, you know, this is funny, but really happened. Because mm. the former governments, 26 years socialist governments, and 20 years military government, and five years first elected government. But they are the same people, just changing their uniforms. Mm -hmm. And they hate and afraid of puppetry because they are named or called puppet government or marionette government. Only uh, one senior general behind manipulating president and minister. So we mm. have no hope mm. to support by the government because they hate even the word puppetry. Okay. So, so now we are a new government led by Lady Aung San Suu Kyi mm -hmm. from 2015 to till now. Very soon there will be new election. So for this government, we hope a lot because they are not uh, puppet government, not military government. So. We hope a lot of support by the government, but they are very busy. Mm. And there are many problems to solve in the country till now, especially in the Western border. So government, they can even look at the gacha session, not only uh, traditional performing arts. Mm -hmm. So until now, we have nothing supported by the government. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tui. You know, for sharing that um, you know historical overview of of Myanmar, and also you know Myanmar as um, a young uh, democratic nation, um, and also the stigma that goes with with puppetry, because you know the, the current government, all governments are considered like a marionette government, um, and this stigma is you know I think it's also very evident in some of our cultures where you know traditional arts at times are seen as uh, outdated uh, or, 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 you know, or, or just, you know, behind times. Um, and, you know, I'm just, I'm, I just want to ask um, also um, to and Alina and Jacob whether um, now we are also seeing um, the fact that we are, a lot of, sorry, COVID has, has allowed for artists to go online, as we've heard from um, Alina as well, you know, um, to, to share their work. Um, and I think this is also very much relevant um, with, you know, one of the questions that I'm actually seeing here from Chris, who's also asking, like, if all these traditional forms are going online, how do we still maintain the character of the traditional arts uh, without uh, losing the, 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 how it's been practiced before? So maybe this is, is this something that um, you grapple with or you know friends within the traditional arts scene has to grapple with? Mm. This is something that I've been doing for probably 20 or so years is um, as a person who walks between two worlds. So I have a white mother and an Aboriginal father. Therefore, I have a foot in both worlds. And I also have a foot in both the contemporary arts and the traditional arts. So what I've been doing with a lot of different communities is that because I went to Western Arts University and I also I learned a whole bunch of skills there, but I also was brought up with traditional, I also was taught traditional dance and customs from around the country. What I normally do is that I work with youth and with elders. So we work with youth at the moment to bring them in through contemporary arts, but then through the contemporary arts practice, we feed in traditional uh, knowledge. And it's a way of kind of disguising, because kids now would much rather be on their phone <laughs> listening to Beyonce, seriously. So um, what we do is we bring Beyonce into the space 
And then we all of a sudden bring a song man or a song woman into the space so that they're not learning just Beyonce, but they're learning a traditional dance and a song as well. So now what we're doing is now that online and so much access to the digital world, which in itself raises a whole lot of problems about equity and privilege because we don't have coverage, good coverage everywhere. Um, but what we are doing is that we're doing the same thing in terms of creating contemporary arts projects, but feeding in traditional knowledge through that. For example, the project that I'm working on at the moment, which is connecting Songline, a particular songline from the south to the north of Australia. And this is a songline that follows the tracks of the dingo, the wild dog. But the wild dog is also um, has its DNA comes from parts of Asia. One of those routes goes through Taiwan. So we're introducing a school, a primary school of children in Taiwan to a primary school of children where my community is online, but they are working with elders in their own communities, but then having to jump online and share and then work, the elders will tell them stories and then artists will go in and work with um, painting, sculpture, animation, weaving, and then the kids will respond to those stories and then jump online and share them between Taiwan and Australia. So they're doing contemporary arts practice, but as a reflection of what they're learning from elders. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. That's beautiful. <laughs> and um, I think Kathy just shared um, Jacob's project there um, on the chat. If anyone's want, if anyone wants to get to know a little bit more about this wild dog uh, project, um, and I need Elena? to speak to you, Elena. Yes, sorry, I need to speak to you, Elena, because the wild dog actually has the song line goes um, up in through Borneo. Uh, because I've I've been working with some. Um, with Taiwan also indigenous in Taiwan for the last three years. It's been really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, yeah, Elena? Your question. Oh, about audiences. Audiences and whether, you know, the traditional yeah. form has so, been altered. You know, even the fact the, the fact of having even a live audience is something that is is new to our form of arts because our I don't know if it's in the in same in your languages, but we have no word for music and no word for art in our language because they're just functional. And, you know, you weren't like glorified as a musician. Uh, instead, your role was to play music and then the village role was to sing back or the village role was to take turns dancing. And you didn't have an audience, you didn't have a stage, you know, everything was in a circle. So even, um, my teacher, Matthew Mao, he started performing out there around the 1980s on stage. And he was one of the first people to do that. And he said it was very hard to um, make the music relevant to, a, to an audience. And so we've also been trying to do that. Um, I've been playing for 19 years now. So even with going online, I think that's just another way of um, our practice if Evolving. You know, if we look back to the past, we've always just had to evolve if we want to stay relevant. So yeah, it changes, but that's that's how it is. That's why I kind of sometimes struggle with the term traditional because actually we are being contemporary and you know, mm. how come a violin is not traditional or a guitar is not traditional? Mm. No, I think, uh, yeah, I, I um, when, when the question was first, um, uh, also uh, shared with me. I was wondering also about the term traditional arts. I think that's why I say not everyone would um, identify with the term um, or you know would would classify their practice as such. But I think there is also value in the term because of the um, you know needs um, of certain traditional communities um, that we might sideline if we just to you know classify them under the arts um in general um i'm just curious elena like uh, for the sape um it's being a musical instrument then we also have to consider the artisans that create the um musical instruments do you do you know whether they how adversely affected they are as well or they've been uh I the good thing is that they've had more time at home to create, right? So now there's a 
uh, more of a supply because there was quite a demand for sapets. Um, but thing is now people don't have spending money to purchase a sape. So even though people are interested, it's it's considered quite expensive if if it's your first sape. It's a thousand ringgit, which is how many dollars? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, about three hundred Sing dollars, three hundred two hundred fifty Sing dollars. So it's yeah. quite expensive, um, you know, in this time when nobody really has much money and it's your first instrument. You know, you can buy a guitar for like fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, or something. So mm. yeah, they, they're making, but not easy to sell. Yeah. If anybody wants one, please drop me a message. They look <laughs> overseas. Yes, um, you know, I think uh, Alina also has a. Uh, YouTube channel, right? Uh, to, for us to subscribe to, or, or you know, uh... <laughs> so I spent lockdown hacking YouTube, like trying to figure the ins and outs of YouTube. It's 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 like learning a whole new platform, and um, so I'm being very diligent in creating content, and I'm coming out with a new single and music video next week uh, in collaborate oh, wow. language. So yeah, please subscribe. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I, I would like to ask, I think this is also relevant to Mr. Tui because um, the reason why I ask, um, you know, the other day when we were having um, our pre-briefing, you did show us a little bit of, of your uh, puppets which are left untouched at this moment. I'm also asking about, you know, the artisan, like the people who actually create those puppets. Uh, do you actually create those puppets yourself, sir? No. Uh... Because uh, I am just the founder and director of the puppet group. So here in Myanmar, there are not so many families left in puppetry. Mm -hmm. So I think here in Yango, only about five families in puppetry doing traditional. And two or five, uh, they are puppet makers. Uh -huh. So they make their puppet. And uh, our puppets are not small size, about uh, 28 inches, 70 centimeter, and heavy about three to four kilogram. And the Myanmar traditional puppet show is not doing by uh, just one man or one woman. We are doing by group, minimum four or five people. And the whole group, the musicians, the storytellers, about 20 artists. Mm -hmm. And the performance is the overnight. So that is why I am unable to stream online as because we need big group to perform a traditional puppet show. Mm. Mm. And I, I wonder whether you have, you know, if you have a puppet nearby to show us how it looks like. Yeah, why uh, not? Okay, if, if, if you, yes. Uh, well, maybe Here you can see wow. how the puppet is big. Mm -hmm. Yes. See? And and you keep it in a glass in a glass uh, uh, cabinet. No, they are just hanging on stand. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so normally I cover with plastic or fabric uh, to avoid dust. But today okay. I want to show you. <laughs> and uh, uh, and and you know back to the the, the issue about you know um, families that are creating these puppets. Uh, do you do you know how they are coping, or do uh, are they also um, also uh, changing careers uh, because of this uh, COVID environment? Maybe I'm back later. Yeah, I think um, nothing because uh, in Myanmar, I told you uh, the puppet show are doing in the. Uh, pagoda or temple festival at night. Ah. The full moon about four or five days. So after 1988, uh, there are very few puppets show in the pagoda festival. Maybe two or three times in a year only. So there, that is that is why uh, before 1988, there are more than hundred families who are working in puppet, traditional puppetry, probably around Myanmar and, and doing the puppet show in the Okura Festival. But after 1988, puppet shows are declined and two or three puppet shows in a year. That is why now just four or five families, they are doing traditional puppetry. 
And some of them, they are producing uh, puppets, not for their performance, for the tourism. You know, they are a souvenir, a small marionette, especially in Bagan and in Mandalay. So they make very small size puppet, not for their performance, and tend to Bagan, Mandalay, the main tourist size of Myanmar. So something like this. So now tourism is totally stopped. They are not doing anymore. Hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Tui, for that. Um, I, I, I just like to, you know, tell um, those who are also present here. If you have any questions, um, you know, so feel free to, to, to you know, uh, populate the chat with those questions. Um, I have, you know, a question to ask. Um, Oh, okay. So I have a question here from Pam. Okay, later I will do that. Um, so maybe a, a question I would like to ask to my fellow panelists here is, you know, we we there is aspirations for us to wait for you know a post-COVID environment, and I really wonder how that would look like. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, what is your how do you feel it's best for traditional artists to move forward? Um, you know you know, uh, looking at the types of losses that we are, losses and sometimes, you know, we can consider some gains as well um, in this period. So how do we, how, what are your uh, takes on your perspective on, on moving forward, um, you know, dealing with, with um, all these um, uh, circumstances? Would anyone want to, you know, it's a scary yeah. question. It is, it is. And I'm, yeah. I don't know how it's going to be. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, 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 okay, probably what I can do now, probably, is, um, you know, Pam Ho has asked um, in the, the chat whether, you know, I can share a little bit because I'm also very involved in the traditional arts scene. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the Singapore perspective, um, I would say that a lot of times the focus is on arts in general. Um, and uh, I've been also questioning a lot about whether there has been efforts to address the issues that traditional artists are going through. Um, similar to some of the conversations that we've had so far, uh, you know, the traditional arts sometimes, you know, for lack of a better way of saying, it, it takes a village to perform. Or sometimes, you know, it, 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 it needs more than just an artist um, to create that experience that we want to create. Um, and, and, and also, you know, so hence we are quite interdependent on one another. Um, and sometimes the forgotten casualties are not so much the artists, it's also the artisans who are involved in the creation of the costume, the creation of the props, um, you know, because they are not in the forefront of presenting themselves. So, so I'm also wondering um, how, um, you know, such funding that it's given uh, from governments or agencies can also address such matters. Um, I, would, I would say that, you know, we are relatively uh, somewhat uh, taken care of to some extent. Uh, and also because, you know, artists in Singapore, we, we are part of the gig economy at most parts. Uh, and as self-employed uh, persons, you know, we, we are also, you know, we can tap into different grants. Um, but a lot of times, because traditional artists might not be like a lot of the veterans and the elders, they might not be uh, conversant in English or in dealing with such uh, bureaucratic uh, forms, for example. So, so they, they might have, they might not participate or they might not uh, even tap into such resources. So now mm -hmm. the question is how can we also help um, in, in allowing them to understand that these are for them, uh, but they just need to do the hard work of, of applying. Um, so, so I, I, I've noticed that happening too amongst uh, my veterans. Um, yeah, so, 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 so that, that in, in a nutshell is also um, how I would say uh, COVID has also affected the traditional arts. Um, and also moving forward, you know, my perspective is, uh, personally, I, I, it's true what Elena said, such a tough question because, you know, to, to, we don't want to be too idealistic, yes. We don't want to, 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 to be too idealistic. Um, but I think there is also uh, opportunities 
that we can still tap on and see whether it can it has longevity and sustainability. Um, hence, traditional artists a lot in Singapore have been going online to share some of the works that they are doing. Um, and also because funding has also been very focused on digital arts. Um, mm -hmm. And hence, you know, a lot more digitalization is happening in the next few months. Um, and we're going to see a lot of that uh, in Singapore until December. Uh, yeah, so that's, do, you have, do you guys have anything to comment with, with regards to what I have to, I've just shared? Mm. Um, I think the, the, it's interesting about the digital space because in one hand, in one hand it's creating opportunities um, for connection. On the other hand, it's also a real threat to, um, to the purity of, of certain practices because when you have to um, subvert or, or abstract them for an online platform, you lose a lot of the, well, a lot of the spirit um, that is with them, uh, that comes with that practice. I think one of the losses that we don't quite know yet, and Elena brought it up earlier about being able to travel because we're here in here in Melbourne, where I am, we're in our second phase of lockdown because we've just had a spike in coronavirus. So I'm supposed to be somewhere else. I'm supposed to be on the other side of Australia, but I can't go much like Elena to do some documenting and recording of elders. So that is one real thing that we can't really tell yet. Um, the losses of what that knowledge is going to be at the end of this. Um, the other thing, the other big threat is that because we have a conservative government here, much like the UK, who are all talking about, you know, um, austerity measures, austerity, 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 everything's being cut, cut, cut. After this, what we're looking at is a smaller pot of funding for the arts. Therefore, um, the traditional arts become even, get placed even lower on the run. But this has all been, this has all been the case in Australia pre-coronavirus. The problems that we're talking about now have already been problems that have existed for, you know, many decades and generations. Um, so it's, you know, it's interesting that um, on the one hand, we have these grassroots collectives that are looking at, you know, providing support and help for each other, because it, what we're finding already is that funding and government structures and bureaucracy have not been helpful. How, why would we expect them to suddenly have an epiphany because we faced a virus together? Mm. Yes, that's, uh, that's a very good points there, um, you know, sharing about, um, you know, uh, how governments are also uh, uh, managing or at least, you know, their treatment towards the arts. No, usually, in a lot of cases, um, when when nation states are affected, uh, the arts will always be the first to to receive cuts, um, mm. and you know, and and not seen as as you know viable means to assist in in development, especially in this period. Uh, thank you, Jacob, for that. Uh, Mr. Twee or Alina, do you have anything to add to 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 what Jacob has just um, shared? Uh, if not, it's okay because I think I also like to, um, you know, highlight some, some of the comments that we are receiving and I think it's also Alina's uh, view that they are also sharing. Um, like for example, Chris and um, Irene Chico has also shared about, um, you know, about traditional arts being done live and, and, and how important that is. Uh, because you know, if it's not done so, somewhat they lose agency because of um, you know how it's being um, you know uh, depicted or being screened on uh, live, um, and you know, and hence you know it also loses its excitement. So maybe Alina or Mr. Tweed, do you have anything to comment on that about live performance? Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think when I said um, that you know the way we're playing online and going digital is just a matter of evolving but what like what choice do we have we can't do live shows and we don't know when is the next time we can do live shows so we have to adapt and evolve but yeah i i really miss a live audience 
and we can't wait to have one but mm. what can we do you know <laughs> yeah yeah uh, Mr. Tui, I think you know you have um, done so much in 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 trying to create that audience, and now you know you are you have lost such audience. Do you miss um, having a live audience yourself? Yes, I also missing my audience because uh, Myanmar Bubble Tree is depend on very based on music. Mm. You know, traditional orchestra playing by six to ten very loud and very hard beating and also mm -hmm. storytelling style so Myanmar traditional puppetry is let's say three and one arts not only uh, manipulating the puppets but also background traditional music and storytelling is very hard beating so this is not watching online you should watch live performance this is the best. So I hope to perform live audience with full of Mm. I'm also thinking a lot too about about future generations. Uh, you know, especially those the direct generations that should be. Um, you know, this art form is being transmitted to. You know, and how live. Uh, performance itself is also part of that experience in learning uh, the traditional art. Um, now, Nabila Said has also provided us with a very uh, interesting question here. Uh, what does the panel think about this loaded term of casualty? Um, is the pandemic showing something really new? Or is it merely making more clear how people or governments treat traditional arts, even pre-COVID? Anybody wants to respond to that? Uh, maybe I think, you know, if I can offer something from, from what I've heard, I think Mr. Tui has provided us that historical insight um, to Myanmar as a young nation, as in a young democratic nation. And we, it's very evident as well that governments, our government policies, um, were, you know, and how their treatment towards the arts were already present before COVID. And now because COVID has happened, um, he has also, you know, I think Mr. Tui has also shared that there has no, there's not been any government funding or government support at all, um, even in this very difficult circumstance. So, you know, just to, to provide some, uh, you know, uh, context. Um, hmm. Yeah, Mr. Tui, you want to add to that? Or maybe Jacob has something to say? Mr. Tui? Not me. No, okay, <laughs> okay. So maybe Jacob. I think one of the, I think one of the things that um, that really does show, and like I was saying before, that the, what what COVID has represent has presented for us is is put a spotlight on existing problems. Like uh, we are a colonized nation here in Australia. We were colonized by the British two hundred and thirty years ago. We uh, still do not have treaty. We still do not have um, an agreement with our government um, about native title. Um, but what we do have is a history of traditional arts being monetized and corporatized. Like it, and this dates back to the mid 1850s, the mid 1800s, where um, you, know, you had uh, entrepreneurs who went about kidnapping uh, traditional dancers from different areas and creating gr dance groups and essentially touring them up and down the east coast of Australia. This also led to human zoos that were taken to New York, that were taken to France, that were taken to London. So what it ended up doing from the mid-1800s is turning traditional arts into a commodity. So that's the practice that we have all inherited since then, that you can't practice your traditional arts unless it's a tourism venture, unless it's monetized. And what that kind of does is lay this, this, um, this problem that culture then cannot be transferred unless it is being supported through uh, the transaction, mon monetary transactions. And that's, I think, the, the bigger problem that we need to face is because not only have we been inherited this, but we've also inherited a hell of a lot of um, 
well, discrimination from these uh, colonial governments where it's been set up that tradition cannot be practiced on certain lands because you have to have permits because it's been sold to mining companies because you know someone else owns your water um you know environmental groups say it's not uh, you cannot hunt certain animals therefore you can't grab the skins that you need to make the drums that have to be made that go with the dance like there's all this bureaucratic nonsense that's been put around that's almost been put up as a barrier to practicing traditional arts, unless, of course, it's the nice, safe um, tourist version. Hmm. Yes, I think we're seeing that a lot too, if, you know, um, from my experience in Sarawak, at the Sarawak Cultural Village. But, uh, Alina, do you have anything to comment on that or not? It's fine, it's okay. I was just, <laughs> just throwing, um, uh, you know, my, my experience there, seeing a lot of this very friendly, touristic, um, uh, versions. Yeah. Um, I don't know. This, uh, this, actually, this is leaving me a lot to think about later tonight because I haven't, I haven't really thought or reflected on, on, on these things, which I probably should. I think the word casualty is very loaded and very dramatic, but in a way, you know, maybe it's necessary for us to use such big words to, to, um, yeah okay uh mr Tui, do you have anything to add to that no okay so maybe i think another question that's coming from kathy is also quite interesting um to ponder about because um a lot of our traditional forms would have some degree you know spiritual elements because i'm also thinking about you know um aboriginal uh performances that i've seen in in okay. australia um and how uh and kathy's question here is um, you know, what do audience and communities lose when we no longer are able to watch and participate in traditional forms, especially since some of these forms are rooted in spiritual practices that, not, that may not work online? Um, Mr. Tweed, do you have anything to share with, with you know, the probably spiritual elements that may come with the, the, the performance of um, puppets? Yes, uh, we have invitation from Thailand, the Harmony Puppet Festival, which uh, held here. But this year, they can uh, do performance. So they invited us to do the performance online mm. to, send, to send how we do uh, puppet show with communities in the COVID PDS. So now we are preparing to make a video of the puppet show to send Thailand to show in the Harmony Puppet Festival. So this is our first online production to show on the internet. Mm, so, so, so you have also agreed eventually somewhat to to have some yeah. online presence. Yeah. Um, and how do you think? Like, uh, have you have you done the recording? Not yet. Not uh, yet. But do you think you know? Do you think there are some elements that might be lost because of the recording? As in, I understand you've shared that, uh, you know, what is best is for a live performance where you see everything. But uh, with, with perspective on spiritual elements, do you, is there a spiritual element um, in, in puppet uh, performance? Now I am thinking how to, to make video short to include everything. Ah. Okay, um, uh, Jacob or Elena, any comments? While well, I look at the questions here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just looking at the questions from Irene and Sharifa mm. about uh, compromises. I think that might have been in relation to what I was saying. And all I could keep thinking was like, especially with the Wild Dog Project that I'm doing now, this is one example. When you look at um, because elders had come to me and said, okay, what we need to do is we need to walk country. We need to take the children. We need to walk that country, walk that song line to teach that song line to a new generation. Um, so what, in terms of capitalist um, and colonial systems, what problems that puts up for us in general is because Australia is such a large continent, if we were to take a group of elders and youth and a new generation of, of 
people belonging to that and walking that country, that could take us anything up to three to four months. Now, when that trip finishes, there's three and four months of rent, of bills, of all kinds of things that need to be paid because we all have to go back to our homes and those homes need to be paid for, that, that electricity needs to be paid for, so does the water. So therefore, that's what the, the current system has presented us. In order to do tradition, the way tradition is supposed to be, you know, the way we're supposed to, where we do go on long journeys, where some ceremonies that we do have last up for two months. But in this current system, in the last 230 years, and all of these kind of um, capitalist, colonial and, and neoliberal systems that we've all adopted, that's generally, that's, that's the block, that's the hurdle. Yes, uh, I think you know, to, to, to probably balance this um, sense of uh, anxiety that we might be facing, I would like to share um, you know, a comment given by a colleague of mine, Kamini, Kamini Ramachandran. Um, so she says here, hi everyone, this is Kamini from Storyfest Singapore. We had to suddenly pivot the entire festival online last minute to the digital medium due to COVID-19. Instead of cancelling the entire festival, we decided to take the components that could translate to video as online storytelling. Um, and, you know, she said about it being launched at YouTube uh, this Friday. Uh, so look out for that. I think Kathy has also shared a link there. Um, and there has been quite positive responses. Um, and now people are more able to engage with folk tales, myths and fairy tales. And of course, she also admits that nothing can replace the intimacy and intensity of a physical storytelling session. Uh, but in the interim, we are able to continue to engage with our audiences. Here we also hear her saying oral tradition is one of the oldest arts forms and in its simplest form it is able to somewhat translate to the digital medium and maintain most of its essence. As long as we have a story, a storyteller and one listener, we are able to share our traditional stories. I think, you know, um, in, in conjunction with what she's also said, uh, I think, you know, um, my fellow colleagues here too have shared a lot about, um, you know, going online to share um, and also engaging with more youth practitioners as well. Um, I would just like to highlight a question that I think this is, uh, it sounds like you know, she's, a, she's, she's, she's a student who's also learning more about tr the traditional arts. She has asked um, if being in the arts industry, um, you know, is there a bright future, especially for performers? Parents have an impression that arts in general does not have a career advancement, especially since in the arts you tend to be self-employed as well. And this COVID situation shows how there aren't many opportunities because we rely on audience. Does anybody wants to comment or to give some uh, advice to, I think, this uh, young lady uh, with regards to career advancements in this period? Well, I think many jobs don't really have advancements in this period. <laughs> um, it, it's just a tough time for jobs. I think, you know, in the arts, you can progress and advance. Um, and, you know, if that's where your heart is and your talent is, then, then you should go for it, but go all in. Mm. I, I, I think, you know, this, this um, environment has taught us as well a lot about resilience. And also it's taught us a lot about, you know, um, I think, you know, if, if there is any intention at all to be an artist, uh, you know, this is something that, that we will be faced with. I think, you know, even pre-COVID, um, as much as it has been very detrimental to a lot of artists, it's also clear that even, even before COVID, such um, stigma or um, anxieties have already been present. So I think, you know, in I think we... we I don't necessarily like to paint a very beautiful picture when we talk about life as an artist. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it gives us some satisfaction to some extent, but also, you know, we also must take this on board that, you know, the journey in life that comes and, and the rejections that we might face. So I think all the more COVID um, should make us even more resilient. And I think seeing from the three of you here today, sharing a lot about your experiences in dealing with non-funding or you know even minimal funding there is still to some extent a desire to practice um if i can now highlight nabila said's question uh 
Uh, is there maybe a need to do away with the categories of traditional versus non-traditional art? Is there a respect for the sacred the, and historic within modern arts administrations beyond a performative or cursory respect? I think, uh, you know, she's also highlighting here about, um, uh, you know, I think, I think a, lo a lot of times when we talk about performing arts, we're also talking about the theatre. And the theatre itself mm -hmm. is very much a Western, um, you know, uh, concept or a Western construct. I think she's also talking about, you know, environments um, wherein, uh, you know, the art form itself doesn't, you know, it's not really practiced within a theatre setting. So like what we've heard from Alina as well about, you know, the circle, circle community, circle dancing, and from Jacob from, you know, with regards to elders. Uh, maybe you have something to share or to, to, to comment on, on, on Nabila's question? What's the cursory respect? Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe if Nabila can share a little bit about her thoughts about what she means by cursory respect. Uh, so respect the sequence, the historic within modern art administrations beyond performative. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, there is a lot of similarities between traditional and non-traditional arts. You know, like I said, sometimes I think, why isn't the piano considered traditional or like guitars and, and that kind of stuff. I think, you know, as a traditional artist or musician, maybe our process is um, a little bit different from non-traditional arts and maybe we need more support in that process a bit um, but you know you do see now contemporary I mean not now but you we have seen contemporary arts that are site specific not in a stage not in a theater you know by a waterfall or in the bus or something like that so I think there I think there it's a lot of um, there is something to say for put it, for doing away with the categories of traditional versus non-traditional, but maybe looking more at the needs, such as like documentation, um, research, and um, I guess the different processes involved, maybe, or or maybe reframing how what you think is traditional and non-traditional. Mm. I think we've had problems with that in Australia too, and it's purely, I think, really over the the kind of categories that traditional arts always get put into, whether it be hobbyist, whether it be folk, whether it be heritage arts, which then is often seen as community practice and not worthy of investment, particularly financial investment. However, um, what, you know, like coming from Australia, coming from a culture who is considered, you know, we're one of the world's oldest living continuous culture in the world. We have carbon dating that suggests that we've been here for 80,000 years on this continent. And there's new carbon dating that is suggesting that we have had occupation of the continent of Australia for 120,000 years, which kind of blows that whole out of Africa notion out of the water. So for us, traditional arts is a way of communicating with each other, but also, um, it's a way, you know, these, these songs and these stories are the way in which we find out who we are and how we belong to a certain place. It tells you about the landscape. It tells you how to navigate that environment, when, how to sustain yourself and your community. Um, so I think when we look at traditional versus non-traditional arts, I would ask of non-traditional arts and contemporary arts to then go, to then ask that, ask a question, what is your function? Thank you uh, for that, Jacob. Um, Mr. Twee, uh, I'm actually quite curious also, um, you know, like uh, when you did say that, uh, you know, Papa, three, uh, Papa Tree Arts is, um, is, is facing, um, you know, not many audiences or, you know, or, or, or at least only support, no, as in no support from the government. I wonder, um, you know, whether the traditional arts uh, for, as in, whether what what is puppetry uh, being faced with? As in, are there more contemporary art forms that are coming um, in Myanmar that 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 is affecting audience ship um, also? I think so because uh, we have collaboration with uh, Alion Francais, ah. the Francais, and also Godet Institute 
the German Gacha Center. So they, they contacted uh, puppet making, storytelling. So my son and my daughter, they participated. And also uh, we, we have collaboration in Thailand, Cambodia as well. Also uh, collaboration with uh, ASEAN Puppetry Association. So uh, now we are trying to step from uh, puppetry to the modern puppetry or contemporary storytelling. So I think uh, the audience is looking for news, change. So we have to show them. The puppetry in tradition is just, uh, so in Myanmar puppetry, so puppet shows are not only for entertaining. They are like uh, medias in old days. There was no television, no newspaper. So puppeteers are uh, tell, telling story, not only telling story, they are conveying message between the government and public in the puppet show as well. So we like to do, like, like in Malaysia, uh, we met uh, the paper monkey, the puppet group. Now they are making uh, contemporary puppetry and uh, the politic storytelling. So in Myanmar as well, we like to do, but at the moment we are not allowed. Thank you so much, Mr. Tui, for that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I think we, we have shared, um, you know, uh, a diverse set of, of expectations, questions and problems in this uh, wonderful uh, panel. Uh, probably, you know, probably before I wrap up, could I just, you know, uh, invite all of you to to share a little bit or last lastly probably about um, what is your hope as, as a practitioner of the form uh, moving forward I know this is difficult but you know I think let's end with with you know feeling that um, all our efforts even in this COVID um, circumstance uh, will be something that is going to help even if it's not us the 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 audience ship that we have created um, you know even in this period. So maybe if I could ask uh, probably Elena, uh, if you have, you know, if you want to share any words of hope. Oh, absolutely. I don't know where to start. Um, but I think with respect to traditional arts, I just, <laughs> I just hope that, um, you know, we will find a way to, I think number one, like I said, the most urgent thing is the, the research and documentation part. So I don't know what it is. Maybe if there's better connectivity suddenly in the rural areas that we can connect um, to the elders over there, or um, you know, if we can somehow start training the young people to use um, recording facilities that we don't have yet. Um, to maybe this will be something to push us that way. Um, yeah, and I also hope people will take this time to learn as well. So I've, I've started giving tape lessons and I think it's a good time to take lessons, especially when performers are not busy performing. So I'm encouraging, yeah, I'm encouraging people to take lessons, not just from me, but, you know, wherever they are to, to also sit with their, this is something else I've done. I've <laughs> encouraged people to sit with their elders, with their parents, um, whoever is around them, and just to draw stories from them. Thank you yeah. so much, Elena, for that. Uh, Mr. Twee, maybe you have uh, uh, words of hope and wisdom to share before we wrap up? Yeah. So, as I said before, I like to show live performance. But this is a challenge for the audience. So, I have to try to change performance online, how to show them. Thank you, Mr. Twee. And for Jacob, uh, any uh, words of hope? Yeah, I think I'd, I would definitely agree with what Elena has said about um, learning and uh, documentation of elders and knowledge. I think looking in some of the comments, there's a couple of words that have popped up, one being sacred and one being sharing. I think in terms of moving forward, it would be great, like in this in this great pause that we now have, if if we as communities around the world, as uh, societies, not just arts communities, can relook at what the function 
of us gathering and arts practice is. Because I think if we look at ourselves as contemporary arts practitioners, this has all come from a traditional practice. Over um, thousands and thousands of years, this contemporary arts movement has evolved into what we are expressing right now. It would be great if in this time, we could look behind us and maybe return back to the sacred and back to the sharing. And I think that's what a lot of people are wanting. They're needing connection right now. Mm. Thank you for that. I think, um, you know, I just realized something that if we were to consider history, um, the four of us come from nations which have been colonized by the British. Okay. Um, we <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Okay. It was just, just to, to, to lighten up the, um, uh, the lighten up spirits. Um, and also to, to also, you know, I would, I was, I would like to say, say sorry, I don't know why I'm, um, uh, I would like to say that I'm very touched by um, the stories that um, the three of you have shared with me today. Um, and I think it also speaks a lot about resilience and also talking a lot about, um, you know, returning back to the sacred or returning back to the function of why we, we create communities in the first place. Um, and, and I thank all of you uh, for, for this. Um, and I hope, um, and as well, you know, to the audience um, that we have been sharing our stories to today, I think they have been uh, uh, an audience that is very engaged and committed. Um, thank you so much for the questions um, uh, that, that have come and also comments that have, uh, have also shared you know, stories of hope, stories of, of, of how um, you know, artists are also um, finding new ways in um, interacting with audiences online. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to say thank you and I would like to pass it. I would like to pass this time now to Nabila. I've written here quite big. Please return it to Thank Nabila. You. Yes. Thank you, Amin. Uh, thank you to the speakers and moderators. I just have some like closing remarks. Um, we, while everyone is still here, uh, hang on, I'm just sharing my screen. So um, for the audiences, uh, the audience who's here, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing this space today with us. Um, I was mentioning that this is the second of this burning question series and our third one is happening just next week. So we hope that you will be able to join us. And, and for that one, the topic or the burning question is, is there hope for integrity and intimacy in online performance? Um, and, and I think that'll be a, a very interesting topic as well, a very different one from today's, but a very interesting one as well. And our panelists are uh, Bernice Lee, who's an artist from Singapore, uh, Katrina Stewart Santiago, who's a um, um, cultural critic from Manila, and there's Maria Tri Sulistiani, who's from Paper Moon Puppet the, um, for, uh, in Jogja, Indonesia. And the moderator is Cory Tan for that one. So we hope you can join us next week as well. So you can, you know, um, sign up for that talk on PTICS. Um, and just um, one last thing before I go is uh, Ask the Creator is also doing reviewing courses. If anyone is interested, uh, we're doing dance and theatre and books review reviewing, so that's kind of interesting. For the dance uh, course, the, the registration actually closes on the 27th of July. So if anyone is interested, please do uh, look at our website and our social media pages for that information. Um, but yeah, that's all. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us and uh, we wish you a very good night. Thank you. Thank you.